Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday, January 21st. We made it to 2021. I am delighted to welcome you all here, and I'm, I feel very lucky to be here with you for the first installment of our new series with Ivor Davis, uh, Up Close and Personal with Chris Hillman. So this series is designed to give um, all of you a front row seat with some of the most legendary and um, famous residents and influential residents of our county here. And frankly, the only reason we did this because I want a front seat up close and personal with these people. So um, before we start, a little housekeeping. One of the special things about this evening is that we will, uh, Chris and Ivor will be taking your questions directly in real time. And when you have questions, please put them in the Q&A portion of your screen, not in the chat portion. We won't see them otherwise. So put them in Q&A and our deputy director at the museum, Denise Sindelar, will be facilitating those questions for you. Um, so I am so, um, I feel very lucky to be able to introduce Ivor Davis. He is legendary in his own right. He is one of our county's treasures. He is a raconteur beyond belief. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Ivor Davis. Well, thank you for that terrific uh, intro. Uh, the check is in the mail. Um, welcome to my first up close and personal with series. And thanks to everyone at the museum for making it happen. Now, I know you're tuning in tonight not to listen to me, but for the wonderful story of Chris Hillman, musician extraordinaire. And you will hear from him. You will, I promise. But please indulge me for a few moments. I bring this up because life is strange. Call it serendipity, call it fate, call it what you will. Even call it time between. Now, I was talking to Chris Hillman's wife, Connie, a few days ago, and suddenly it hit me. These are the facts of the time between. I was born in London, England in 1938. Chris was born 6,000 miles away in Southern California six years later. In the early 60s, I came to America and I worked at the May Company store at Fairfax and Wilshire in Los Angeles. And about the same time, so did Chris Hillman, but we never met. Chris grew up in Rancho Santa Fe. I worked on a newspaper that covered Rancho Santa Fe in San Diego County. We never met. In the 60s, Chris hung out with the Beatles, and so did I. So close, but we never met. Fast forward to the 80s, Chris moved to Ventura, so did I, and we finally met. And now here we are in 2021, our lives intersecting, intersecting for tonight's get-together. Well, you might, you know, the Zoom get-together. So let's talk about time between which just happens to be the title of Chris's riveting new memoir, Time Between My Life as a Bird, Burrito Brother, and Beyond. So welcome again, everyone. But before we get this show on the road, let me tell you just a little about our distinguished guest. He first came to fame with a pop group that rocked the music world he was a member of the Foxville Squirrel Barkers. Now, do I hear you say, who are the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers? And you don't know their smash hit album, Bluegrass Favorites? Well, get Chris's book and read all about it. Seriously, I think most of all of you know that Chris has spent almost six decades making magnificent music. A multiple Grammy nominee, three times ACM, that's American Country Music winner, 
and, and, and an inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And he's the winner of countless awards during a lifetime in music. He hit the music world headlines with The Birds, then the Flying Burrito Brothers, Desert Rose Band, so much more. So many years at the top of his game. And he's still at the top of his game. And did I mention he has a new book out? Time Between, which you can get at the Timber Bookstore on Main Street in Ventura, or for those of you who are around the world, all over the place, you can get it on your local bookstore or at www.chrishillman.com. But let's get this show on the road. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, welcome Chris Hillman. Thank you, Ivor, so much. What a wonderful introduction. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. First of all, before you get it, do you want, do you want to say something else, oh, Chris? No, I'm sorry, no, I keep I, 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 I'm very, I loved, loved your intro. It's very kind, very kind. And yes, I did not know that Ivor worked at the May Company at Fairfax and Wilshire. I was there in 63. Three, I believe, sixty-two, actually sixty-two, in the stock uh, stock department. A little bit early, huh? A little too early. They fired me. They fired. I got fired me. too. What happened? I don't understand. We can discuss that on another show. We'll do later on this year. <laughs> okay. So before we get into your music story, Chris, it was fascinating that you opened the ch first chapter of your book with a story about your experiences with the Ventura and Santa Barbara County Thomas Fire. And can you tell us, it's kind of an interesting beginning, tell us how you decided to go that way to start. Well, book. it really, uh, Ivor, it was really uh, Scott Bomar who heads up the publishing wing of BMG, which is the publisher of the book. And it was brilliant. I, I, we had discussed opening the book with uh, the birds at the Ed Sullivan show backstage, of course, which was fascinating, which I describe in the book of uh, live television back then. So uh, he had the idea of opening with the Thomas fire, which is really brilliant. And um, it was um, two months uh, since Tom Petty had passed away and that had, was devastating to me. And then of course, December 4th rolls around 2017 and we have, uh, the Thomas fire, which was pretty intense. I mean, it was really a, a firestorm. And uh, Connie and my wife and I were, we were out of the house for eight months. We didn't lose the house. We lost our kitchen and our family room. By the grace of God, there were two fire, county firemen that drove up and had just enough water on their truck to put that fire out in our house. They saved our house. There was no water in the hydrants. We all know that story, but that's another story for later too. <laughs> um, I, I, this is a little bit out of order of your career, but Tom Petty was very, I mean, you two were very close. Um, and sadly, as you said, he died not long ago. Um, can you just, I know. out of order again, Chris, tell us a little bit about your involvement with the with, well, with, Tom, with, uh, we he had produced my the last record I did in January of 2017, and uh, it was quite interesting how that happened, which is very well described in the book. I had no intention of making any more records, and Tom, I found out was interested in working with me, and uh, we talked it over, and, and I, I I thought I, I loved what he did. I thought he was fascinating fabulous musician and it was a it was just a great honor so we made the record in January and um, about six weeks really went well it was great working with him and then come uh, October uh, I was on the road promoting the the record and I find out Tom had passed away when I was devastated and um, wonderful man but yeah we can go um, let me just take you back uh, uh, quite a few years, a few decades, Chris. Um, tell us about growing up in Rancho Santa Fe because it was very different, I believe, then than it is today. 
Um, and uh, I'd love to hear a little well, bit more about that. Well, my father uh, moved us down from Los Angeles in 1946, and I was about two years old. And we had basically a, a one-story sort of a ranch house. It was very rural. And Rancho Santa Fe had not become what it is now, which is a very, very wealthy enclave, huge. Uh, I do remember being in the bird's ivor in 1965, and I knew this lady who was a real estate broker, a quick story, and um, uh, I go visit down there, and she says, have you got any money? I said, well, yeah, I was 19 years old. I said, I, she says, can you get hold of $10,000? We'll buy a lot here in Rancho Santa Fe. Oh, I don't want to do that. She says, you're going to regret this the rest of your life. Well, the lots are going for $2 million. $3 million now. So that was one of my brilliant moves. But uh, it was really wonderful time to grow up. It was um, very uh, post-World War II America. Uh, it was heavenly. It was just lovely, lovely growing up there. Yeah. And it became something else. And I moved when I was about 15, 16. Yeah. But, but you also tell the wonderful story of how you got into music and, and your expensive first guitar, which I think people well, love to hear it. Um, I, I, of course, my age, uh, we, we were right there when rock and roll just blossomed in 56, 1956, 57. Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Elvis Presley, of course, and the Fats Domino and Everly Brothers. And I didn't want to learn the guitar then. I don't know why. It wasn't something that was... Uh, drawing me in and it was years later about 1959 when folk music came along and I wanted to learn the guitar hence the expensive guitar was a ten dollar guitar in T we bought in Tijuana my blessed mother god bless her she uh she's all right we'll go down to Tijuana and find something that works and I kid you not it was a ten dollar guitar it did work great it worked for about a year and then it sort of imploded and uh, she said, always, she said, if you, if you stick with this, I'll help you buy another one, a better one, which meant if you save enough money, I'll chip in 25% of that money to help you buy another one, which she did. She honored the agreement. I bought a better guitar. End of story. <laughs> so, I don't think there's a $10 guitar in Tijuana anymore, but this was 1960, 61. Yeah. Um, I wondered at this point, Chris, if you pause a little bit and if we can get Jonathan to show some of the pictures of the early mm -hmm. Hillman lifestyle. So, Jonathan, if you're there, okay. can you show this us? This is uh, me, of course, the little guy s snarling at my dear father. Uh, and we're in Rancho and we're uh, over at someone's uh, ranch. Uh, I think we're going to do some riding. And I always loved it because my brother and I had these cool leather jackets that my mother bought us at Sears Roebuck, which was called Sears Roebuck then and became Sears and is now out of business. I guess. But uh, it's a great photo because uh, my brother was about six years older than I am and he didn't stick with horses, but I did. And he actually was the first guitar player in the family. He, he was learning guitar back in 1950, 51. Didn't stick with that, didn't stick with the horses, but went on to become quite uh, quite good in his own right. So, but yeah, it's a great picture. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, can you hit, hit another picture for us, uh, for Chris to talk about, please? Ah, this is the Golden State Boys and I'm 18 years old. And that is, to my immediate left, is Don Parmalee playing banjo. That's Rex Gosden playing the bass, which you can't see the bass. And Vern Gosden, his brother. And Vern became a very, very famous country star in, in the late 80s and 90s. And Rex was a very famous songwriter. Both of them have gone. In fact, all of them have passed on. They were about 10 years older than I was. They showed me the ropes. They were my window on authenticity having been that they were all from the South. Don, the banjo player came from Kentucky. Vernon Rex came from Alabama. I was the kid and um, they literally showed me everything. I learned the music working with them. I learned the culture. I learned what they ate, how they thought. It was the greatest experience in my life. Wonderful people, yeah. Jonathan, hit it again, please, Jonathan. Next photo. Next photo, please. 
<laughs> ah, and there's uh, a band I was in before the Golden State Boys was, was Ivor's favorite band, the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers. And you notice in this photo, everyone has a mustache. I don't because I couldn't grow one yet. I wasn't old enough. And I look like I'm 12 in this photo, but we were playing Disneyland and uh, they wanted us to wear hats and sport coats that night, which is great because it looks to me like, like a real bluegrass band from Kentucky, the way we're dressed and where we're playing, it's great. And it was a good band, I must say. We, we were very good. <laughs> Scroll bar. And I, I must say, Chris, in all, all your early pictures, you look, you look as though you're 12. I mean, you were such an innocent boy, and now look at you today. In this town, good Lord help us. <laughs> but yeah, those were all wonderful. Okay, we, we, we have another picture, Jonathan. Ah, so this is the birds, and we actually wore suits for about 20 minutes, okay? Our management thought we should get suits because the Beatles had suits. So there we are in our suits. We're in the Columbia Studios working up a song and I'm playing this bass that I'd gotten hold of, but I really didn't know what I was doing yet. David Crosby, as you can see, which is uh, the fourth man standing, uh, wasn't playing guitar yet. Gene Clark was playing guitar, who's next to him. And David uh, decided he wanted to be the guitar player and eventually took that from Gene. And anyway, that's an early, early shot of us because the suits went away immediately. And uh, uh, interesting side note, which is in the book, is that we worked zeros on the Sunset Strip. Little Richard's band came in a week after we were done. We left our suits in the dressing room and they got them. They took them home. They were very happy with those suits and we were happy they they were happy because we didn't like them. End of story. Chris, in, in, the, <laughs> Chris, in the early days, you write about, I say, living in the lap of luxury. I'm kidding you, of course. You had no money. You were sharing a one-bedroom garage apartment on Melrose Avenue. Your bandmates, Mike and Jean, moved into tight accommodation, and others lived in a flea bag Hollywood hotel. Yep. So how long did that last before all of a sudden you saw what you saw in February 1964? Well, actually, that came along after we saw the Beatles. I mean, we didn't, as we not necessarily saw them together. I didn't even know them at that point, but uh, I saw them stumbling into my mother's apartment in Los Angeles and at that particular Sunday night and there were they, excuse me, there they were on the Ed Sullivan show. Mind you, I had heard of the Beatles. I hadn't heard them though. And then um, uh, I didn't know uh, McGuinn, Clark and Crosby, got to know them later. We all would uh, uh, go to the Troubadour. Uh, it was a folk club. And of course that's where everybody started out. And uh, it went from there, yeah. Um, Beatles were a huge influence. We must have watched A Hard Day's Night uh, at the Pix Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. None of this is around anymore. We must have watched that movie 20 times and we studied it. And that's where McGuinn saw the 12 string. He wanted to get the Rickenbacker 12 and, and everybody got the right instruments and all of that, so yeah. Well, tell us about the formation of the birds and you've touched upon the Beatles link, Chris, but put it into, into context. Well, um, initially, uh, I had been asked, knowing the, uh, the fellow working with um, our original manager was named Jim Dixon, and I had known him. He was working, he had been working with the Golden State Boys, the Hillman, the Bluegrass Band. And he calls me one night, he says, come down to the World Pacific Studios. You gotta hear these guys, do you know Gene Clark and Roger McGuinn and David Crosby. I said, I know who they are. I don't know them. He says, come and listen to them. I go down and they're playing with one guitar and they're singing beautiful, sound great. And I had high standards. I'd been working with the Gosden brothers who were unbelievably good singers. And I said to Jim, I said, they're gonna do something really great. This is great. I go back to my gig I had in Westwood and two, three weeks later, I get a phone call. Can you play the bass? Well, in two seconds, I knew I'd better have the right answer. I said, I think I can handle that. That was my answer, I can handle that. I show up and three days later, I'm assuming they know what they're doing. I walk in, there's one amplifier in the studio 
Roger McGuinn's plugged in. I plug into that amp. Michael Clark, the drummer, has cardboard boxes, a cymbal, and a snare. I said, this is a skiffle band. You know what I'm saying. So uh, this is Lonnie Donegan. I, did, I said, is this a rock band? I don't know what we're doing here. And uh, but So we start playing, and we learned how to do this. Roger McGuinn was probably the most seasoned player at the time, but we all uh, developed a sound initially uh, emulating the Beatles, but then going off in our own direction where we created a, a very unique sound. Uh, Chris, when I, when I first met you, uh, we, we had a lot in common because you told me some great stories about the Beatles. Now, you told me, you, you mentioned how you saw them and were sort of inspired by them on the Ed Sullivan show in 1964. Mm -hmm. um, pick up the story from them because how did you end up becoming pals with the Beatles? Because they liked you they liked what you were doing well their press agent who you knew and worked with was derek taylor and derek had left london he had he had split up with brian epstein came to the states la and he took on some clients the beach boys and he took us on uh early on and before anything was going on and uh, that was a big part of it all and then we had a a, a a deal with Columbia Records to do a single. If the single took off, we would have been able to do and negotiate to do an album. And the single, excuse me, was Mr. Tambourine Man and it did take off. Derek, uh, with the success of Mr. Tambourine Man, wanted to triumphantly march back to London the summer of 65. We weren't ready to go to London yet, but he wanted to go back and I think show Brian Epstein that look what I've done, I think, because knowing Derek, he, he he could do things like that. Wonderful man, wonderful man. And we go back to London and over to London, we meet the Beatles and, uh, and I hung out with them. That's when uh, John Lennon got me one night. I was so shy. I would turn beet red if somebody looked at me funny. So that was the night we're uh, in a, uh, someone's house. It was Brian Jones and John Lennon and I think Harrison and uh, all of the birds and, and John Lennon, an uh, hour into the meeting, we're hanging out and he says, looks at me says, does this one speak? Does this one speak at all? <laughs> I turned beet red. And that uh, I, uh, I or you knew John Lennon. And of course that would be something you would imagine he would say that, you know, but it was yeah. fine. And uh, it was- But, but, but yeah, yeah, he, 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 did, he was a provoker. Oh, yeah, he loved to provoke. snarky guy. But, 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 but the thing is, the question I have, were you a, can you speak? I think you can. Yeah. Now. But I was very shy in the birds, the early days, the old videos of the birds. I'm in the back playing the bass, you know, uh, doing my job. Yes. Yeah, I'm jumping ahead, Chris, but but it, it, I mean, it is hard to imagine a rock and roll person, a music person like you saying you were shy. I mean, was it because it, it, you, you you matured late? Well, like let, a, let me back that up musically. When I, you're coming out of bluegrass, which is very serious music. Bluegrass bands, the old bands were not showmen. They'd get up there and they're very serious. They play and it's, boy, you're, you're gonna think a lot about what you're doing. So when I first see rock yeah. and roll and it's a whole other, uh, different stage presentation, oh my God, what are they doing? They're jumping around, they're moving, they're smiling. And, it was a, a change for me to uh, have to learn how to do that. And yeah, I was shy. I was, it was a new thing for me, but I learned how to do it. I had great teachers. I had wonderful people to learn from as far as singers and, and how to entertain. We, the birds were not big entertainers. We would get up and play. We were musicians. We were serious musicians. So. Yeah. Um, not, I, I didn't know the story until I read it in your book. How did you come up with the title, uh, the name for the group, The Birds? That was, uh, Roger McGuinn came up with that idea, but I think he came up also with the idea of spelling it with the Y as the Beatles changed their spelling. I don't know what that was about, but in fact, when they did name it, I don't even think I was there that night. They were all having dinner somewhere. Uh, Roger and David uh, were uh, with the, uh, one of the other managers and uh, it became the birds, B-Y-R-D-S. Now, funny enough, Ivor, when we went over to England with Derek Taylor, the summer of 65, we get off the plane at Heathrow and we get served a lawsuit by another band called the birds, B-I-R-D-S and Ronnie Wood was in that band, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones. So 
he has often said, oh my God, we were looking for some publicity, anything we could get. We couldn't get arrested, so we, let's sue the birds from America, which went nowhere, of course. <laughs> um, before I ask you about those great songs that were, were smash hits for you, Mr. Tambry, Man, Turn, 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 I think I'm going to ask Jonathan to play Chris Hillman fairly recently singing Turn, 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 because it's pretty magnificent, and you are well, front row it's, it's, center. It's performed in acoustically, oh. too. It does. There's no drums or electric, but yeah, it, it, it's a one. Yes. You know, Chris, I didn't say, of course, that with you is the great Herb Peterson and, of course, John Jorgensen, mm -hmm. who are on, and, and we've been privileged to see you all perform in our town in Ventura County. So I, I wanted to. And John, to, to is, act. A, John is a resident of Ventura himself. Oh. Himself is. Himself, good. <laughs> um, uh, is there a story, Chris, about how you got those songs and, and who came up with the idea that you should do those hits? Well, Tambourine Man, uh, of course, was a gift really from Bob Dylan. He had, he had I, I finally realized he had recorded that uh, and he didn't like the way he recorded it and they did it later, but we, he, he was fine to let us record it and we changed the time around because he had it more of in a, in a country feel, more of a two, four beat. And uh, we, Roger McGuinn put it into a 4-4 beat. You could dance to the song, which is when Dylan heard us, he, he said, wow, you can dance to it. And he just didn't cross his mind. So that was a wonderful thing. It was a beautiful song. But uh, back then, as you know, I've, uh, AM radio, you were, you were really reduced to a certain amount of time, about two minutes, two minutes 30 for a song. Uh, FM rock radio was not going yet. This is 60, 1965. Um, the other song, which was really good, that we, which you heard just recently, Turn, 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 um, we knew about that song from Pete Seeger, okay, yeah. and we cut that, and um, that was probably, I think, is the, the signature bird song, Turn, Turn, Turn. Hmm. And I think, Chris, you said in your book that there was a, there's a Ventura County guy uh, called Bob Eubanks, who people know for many reasons, and Bob Eubanks somehow was able to help you with with the songs uh, in, in well, Bob was a, story? a huge DJ on KRLA right in Los Angeles and Bob broke the record he broke uh tambourine man Derek hammered him to death on that and he got it he broke it on KRLA and it started to take off and it went uh got caught picked up in San Francisco and all of a sudden took off across the country uh, and in Europe, and uh, it was number one single. Was, uh, we couldn't believe it. Fantastic. Um, let's talk about, if you wouldn't mind, um, in 1969, you write that the, the murders of involving Sharon Tate and all the rest changed the whole vibe of the, of the scene. Um, you write about that in your book, and, um, and at the same time, let's talk about Terry Melcher because Terry was very close to you guys. So I'm sorry to throw it in sort of rather dismembered way of asking you, but I think you know what I'm asking for. It's a little um, bit of memory on that. Terry Melcher was Doris Day's son, okay? And his father was Marty Melcher, who was a uh, head of CBS and Marty adopted Terry. Terry was a staff producer at Columbia Records. When we got our singles deal, he was assigned to produce us. He was very good and he understood what we wanted to do. And he did uh, the first album, uh, Mr. Tambourine Man album. He did the second album, Turn, Turn, Turn. He was a very good producer. Um, when I said in the book, uh, the, the vibe had changed. I can't remember if I wrote it that way, but I guess I did. What really happened, Ivor, in 1969 was not only the Manson murders, it was, I, had, I played Altamont. And after playing the Monterey Pop Festival uh, two years earlier, which was beautiful, just lovely festival, 
uh, Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and Otis Redding. This is wonderful. And then in within a two year period, I'm, I'm playing Altamont where people are beating each other up and the guy gets killed and I couldn't wait to get out of there and put it that way. So that to me was the end of the 60s with that Altamont free show that the Rolling Stones did in Northern California. And then uh, as it went through the next few months in the summer of 69, the Manson family first with Sharon Tate and all of that, then the Bianca uh, murders. And uh, uh, originally they were going, as you know, because you wrote a wonderful book about that. You were a reporter on scene, on, on the scene during that whole period that uh, they were after Terry Melcher because Terry, they thought was gonna, Manson thought Terry was gonna give him a record deal. Well, Charlie Manson was not a good uh, artist. He was just not very good. He was an insane man. And, and so there you have it. But that particular three month period, the summer of 69 was as much the end of it all as the summer of 63 or 64, or 65 was the beginning of that beautiful yes. idyllic 1960s thing. Chris, moving on a little bit, um, when the birds broke up, you began a long journey that gave the world Chris Hillman in assorted incarnations, uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers and all the other groups that we know about. So was this your way of surviving the roller coaster music life that was going on? And tell us a little bit about how you moved on so well. I uh, only moved on uh, as I felt the calling. Uh, Par Graham Parsons and I, uh, we had hired Graham Parsons in the Birds. Uh, he was in the Birds for about six months, I think, as an employee. And, uh, and then we went off and started the Flying Breeder Brothers because he had a love of country music as I did, you know, coming out of bluegrass. And uh, that was good for the first year. It was very good working with Graham. We wrote a lot of songs that have held up quite well as, as other people have recorded our songs. And after that one year, we sort of lost contact and we parted company and I kept the band together for a little while. And then I get another opportunity. So in the book, Ivor, I write about opportunities and it applies to everybody who's reading this book. In your life, a door will open if it has any semblance of integrity and dignity, you might wanna go through that door and see what you can do with your life. I did. Uh, and most of the time I picked the right thing to do. So I went from the Flying Breeder Brothers into Manassas with Stephen Stills, which was a wonderful band. Stephen decided to do this for a couple of years. I was great. I was ready to leave the Burrito Brothers and off we went. Had a great two year period. He gets summoned back to Crosby, Stills and Nash and then all of a sudden another door opens and it's Souther Hillman Fure. I guess all these, I was in all these law firm names, you know, Souther yeah. Fure. And uh, J.D. Souther and Richie Fure, and Richie Fure, of course, this is also incestuous. Richie Fure had worked with Stephen Stills in Buffalo Springfield. I knew them both. Off I go with Richie and J.D. It was okay. Didn't do as much as they as thought that it would. And after that, I made some solo records in the 70s and Ended up working with McGuinn and Gene Clark again in the late 70s. And um, I mean, there was always something that was intriguing and was happening. And there was never any really dead time for me. I, I always said, originally, you know, when I was younger, I always thought about going back to school as to, uh, registering for the next semester, whatever was hmm. coming along. And but some, once again, the door would open and say, so I was really finally realized I was supposed to be a musician, I guess. So here I am. At 76 years old, I'm still jumping around here. So it's... <laughs> Keep jumping around. But I must ask you about Honey Pappas. She makes her entry on page 158 of your book. And you say... What was that name again? What was the last story, name right? again? Oh, Connie right. what? Connie Pappas. Pappas. Uh, Greek woman. Yes. Uh, Greek, the Greek woman. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you remember her? Ever. Yeah, yeah, the one, the Greek one, yeah, so, the Greek woman. Uh, so you've got to tell us about that story because in the book you write, she's my angel, my saving grace, my true love. You write about her so endearingly. So tell us a little bit about the lady, the rock in I your life. I met her in 1968. I absolutely thought she was so lovely. 
and we dated ever so innocently. And then I went off on a Burrito Brothers tour. I dated her for a, two or three dates, went to the movies and dinner. Off I go and with the Burrito Brothers, I didn't see her for a few years. All of a sudden I'm back in t to LA in 1973 or four and there's Connie. I said, oh my God, what have you been doing? Well, she had been a, working at, at a, a recording studio as a receptionist. And when I saw her again, three, four years later, she was working for Elton John. I said, my God, what happened? You're doing so well. And uh, at that particular moment, we fell in love big time and dated for three or four years. I proposed to her. We were married 42 years ago. Roger McGuinn played turn, turn, turn at our wedding as I came out. We did the wedding at the uh, Yamashiro Gardens. I'm talking diversity here. We had yeah. the Yamashiro Gardens and Japanese restaurant and a mariachi band was the entertainment. Isn't that wonderful? And a great wedding, it was fantastic. She has yeah. been a uh, unbelievable person in my life. Uh, she, we have two beautiful kids grown up and we have wonder, two gr wonderful grandkids. But we have a wonderful life together, and that's what it's all about for me. Yeah. Chris, um, because we want some questions and answers coming up in a few minutes, I'm just going to, I'm sorry I'm going to miss some of the key points of your career, but one thing always fascinated me about you, the fact that you learn at, at what stage that songwriting is a lucrative <laughs> business. I say that because because Chris, as you know, I mean, Bob Dylan just sold his record collection. I, I'm being facetious, sold his music. Paul McCartney has made a lot of money by buying his music. But my question is, pop stars, rock and roll people knew very little about music, but you got a quick education by not going to uh, music Royalties 101. Tell oh, I, I, I made my uh, initial mistakes like everybody. I think, uh, Ivor, you have to give a little to get something. You know what I'm saying? To get in the door, sometimes you have to give. Uh, but yes, yeah, songwriting, when I did start writing songs, who knew? I, uh, and uh, it is, it's really, um, I'll give you a wonderful quote that Merle Haggard said, the late Merle Haggard. He said, Merle Haggard, the, the singer, is subsidized by Merle Haggard, the songwriter. And is if that ever was so true, and it's uh, it's all part of your art, and you're you're writing things, and then you're pre pre performing them, and like I said, the uh, the greatest uh, stamp of approval is when other people do your songs. I think it's fantastic, and that has happened to me, which is great. So, um, yeah, but I I think initially when you're young, uh, you, you sometimes have to. I think, um, thank you, Chris. Um, you know, we could go on much longer, but I know that there are many out there from all over the country and all over the world wanting to ask questions. So uh, I'm going to pause here and ask Denise if she would give us some of the questions mm -hmm. for Chris, because I want people people's questions answered. I'm happy to, Ivan. Thank you so much. There are a lot of people who want to ask a lot of questions and actually reminisce a little bit with you, Chris. So uh, first question is from Doug Rodriguez and Doug says, you signed the back of my 1951 no caster at the Vagabond with the KVTA folks and Tom Spence. So that's who I am. Do you remember a concert with the birds at Nassau Coliseum in 1966? Can you talk about that? You know, I don't remember that concert. I do know we played Nassau Coliseum and it was quite an, uh, uh, quite an event to play that kind of a, a venue. Uh, it's hard to remember all the shows, but um, 66, we were really going well. 67 was, I felt personally was one of my great years in the birds because I was really writing a lot of songs then and, and I was more uh, getting more upfront, getting over the, comp, the shyness and all that. But um, yeah, I, I wish I could remember all those shows, but I'm glad she enjoyed it. Thank you, Dan. Great. Well, here's a question from Gary Kuhn. Gary, Gary's asking, what is your favorite 
bass guitar to play, your absolute favorite? Oh gosh, I um, I like Fender uh, basses, um, and I started out with a Fender bass, and I went to a Guild double cutaway hollow body, and uh, which they started to remake about two years ago uh, as a Chris Hillman model, which was very, I was very honored they did that. Um, and then I had another uh, fellow that I worked with uh, in the Marty Stewart band, Chris Scruggs, who's the grandson of Earl Scruggs. And he gave me one of his basses, which was a Fender jazz bass, a really sweet gift that he gave me. But yeah, I think I'd go with Fenders on basses, yeah. Right. So here's a question from Mark Anderson. Were the cool clothes that you had in the Flying Burrito Brothers made by friends or who was your designer? We had our, our, our rhinestone suits made by Nudie, but actually it was Manuel who worked, who was Nudie's son-in-law back in 1968. Uh, Manuel is now, of course, a very famous man in Nashville, uh, tailor to all of the country stars, but we had our suits done by uh, Manuel through Nudie's uh, Rodeo Tailors, as did all the early country stars, they would get those suits done, yeah. But they were so full of light. <laughs> and one night we didn't play so well, and I, I said, we have these suits on, and they're like shining in the lights, and we, we, were, we had messed up on a song or something. It was this funny, funny, ironic thing that happened. But yeah, that's how they were. Yeah. Quick question from David Lowe. David says, in the book, you talk about being the shy bird and you mentioned this earlier and indeed some of the photos show you looking pretty uncomfortable on the back row. How did you overcome that personality trait? Or have you? I have. Now you can't shut me up. I talk too much, but no, I overcame it by just growing up and getting having confidence in myself and i think it's you begin to start to like yourself you know and it's basically as simple as simple as that i started to like myself i said i'm okay i can do this and if they can do it i can do it and then all of a sudden the confidence the confidence comes up the shyness goes out the window and it's a there's a fine line you don't want to become uh, overbearing you want to try and get hold of that wonderful virtue, humility. Humility, the tough one to hold on to, right? But uh, it's just as a uh, really growing up and getting going through it all. Yeah, I think around by the time the Burrito Brothers came along, I pretty much, no, I take that back. 1967 in the birds, I was writing, I was singing, I was up in the front singing leads and stuff. And it was on, the, the shyness was out the door at that point, out the door. So I've got a question from Alan Shapiro. So anything you didn't do that you wish you could have done? Any song surprise that you, that had become a hit? Any song that you thought would have been a hit but never made it? Oh gosh, there's a lot of songs. I, I you know, the, the, the writer or the artist is the worst judge. And you think, oh, this is the one. And it's usually the one that's really successful is the one you, think least think of as being good that's very interesting you think this is the one it's like writing a song I said I've got a perfect song for so and so which is not something they would like at all but it's just how you're looking at it all what have I regrets in life well yeah I, I can go back to the confidence issue I wish I had the confidence a little earlier on but it wasn't meant to be so I, I went through uh, the few first few years learning my craft absorbing my craft. And like I said earlier, I had the most wonderful teachers vocally, McGuinn, Gene Clark, and David Crosby, Stephen Stills, great, great singers. I learned watching them. They encouraged me. They were great people. They still are uh, those that are still alive with us, but they were all good people. And I'm uh, very close friends with all the people I've worked with living in ones that aren't around. I I still hold them in fondest memories. Yeah. Great. So there's a question from Nick Mervos. Are there any artists or bands that you'd still like to work with in the future? That I still like. Yeah. I'm sorry. Or that you would that you would like to collaborate with in the future? Oh gosh, I don't know. I I I I love the Bee Gees. I thought, and okay, the 
disco stuff was sounds a little sort of silly, but it, they were so good. They were such good singers. And I'd love to meet Barry Gibb. I think he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people that I, I look up to and, and uh, uh, Eric Clapton's wonderful as a singer to um, even more as equally as, as good a guitar player as, as also a singer. Um, I've gotten to work with some wonderful people. I must say the last uh, outing was with Marty Stewart and in the fab fabulous superlatives and Roger McGuinn. For uh, 18 shows we did uh, celebrating the Sweetheart of the Rodeo, Bird's album, 50th anniversary. That was a fantastic tour. Why? Because Marty is so good and he's such a gentleman and the guys he works with are such professionals. And that's what it's all about. And I, you know, there were lots of times uh, people didn't take it as seriously as they should. When you're in a position of really having the success and then you throw it out the window and, you know, and that happens so often. But by the grace of God, I did. I kept going and going and going and it worked out all right. Okay, here's a follow. Here's a question from Irvin Hansen. He wants to know what was it like working with Gene Clark and the Gosdens on the Gene Clark's solo album? Um, I don't know. It was great. I mean, Gene, Gene they, they worked quite well together. I think Gene, that was Gene, one of Gene's first solo albums, and he, he had Vern and Rex Gosden uh, sing with him on it. And most of Gene's stuff I worked on after he left the Birds, I must say, through the years. I played bass or mandolin on most of his records. And Gene was a, he was a very talented man very, very talented man, but uh, but haunted by so many issues in his life, which was sad because uh, it was hard to deal with that. So yeah, wonderful man. Question from Tim Harrison. What are a few of your top enjoyable places or venues that you've performed? Uh, what are your thoughts on today's music, style and performances? Well, there's some wonderful places. I've got, I've, I've got, I've had the opportunity to play Carnegie Hall a few times, in a couple of different entities. Um, lots of uh, Town Hall we played with Marty and Roger uh, you know, a year and a half ago, which I'd never played Town Hall in New York City. Loved it. Uh, and now uh, I don't know what's out there now. As far now, if I was to go out on the road again. Uh, Denise, I, I would be playing uh, um, theaters and um, which I do. I play theaters and um, gosh, what are they called? Um, whatever. Anyway, and music I listen to. I'm so out of the loop on the new rock and roll bands. I don't know what's going on. I tend to uh, still listen to older country music, older bluegrass folk music, blues, jazz. Um, and the new stuff, I'm not that up on to comment on it, you know, I really am not. So unfortunately, it's a different world. That's a-okay. <laughs> so Don Worth wants to know, what about the Sweetheart of the Rodeo that are you, what are you most proud about? And what is your favorite song on that album? Um, well, I wasn't a big fan of that record when we made it. I thought it was okay. I'm being serious. Uh, and then it took off about five, six years later, all of a sudden people caught on to it. What the, what the album accomplished was it opened the floodgates for that wonderful term. I've grown accustomed to it now, country rock. It opened the floodgates in 1968 and then the Fr Flying Breeder Brothers came out, Poco, Your Prairie League. It all led up to the Eagles which was very good because it went right in a, a chronological order up until the Eagles got together. And I firmly believe Glenn Fry and Don Henley studied us all and learned what not to do. And they did it all right. They did it very well. Um, as, but that's, yeah, I, uh, as far as the new music, I don't know what's going on. And, and uh, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, uh, it took on a whole new life 10, five, 10 years later on down the road. And, uh, when we did go out and do the anniversary tour, we were selling out every night in uh, performing arts theaters, big theaters, this and that. So I was trying to think of the name. Performing arts theaters are where I work now. 
when and if I ever work again, if any of us work, <laughs> work, we will rise from the ashes, I guess. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely, we will. Live music lies ahead for I all of so. us. We can't wait. Yeah. Um, so Jim Heller is uh, acknowledging that you've got a room full of guitars there. And he wants to know if you can tell us a little bit about them. What are some of your favorites? You've got, you're surrounded by your instruments. So what I'll are sell they? sell any one of them for $19 right now. I, uh, <laughs> I play them all. I don't need them. I need one. I need one guitar and one mandolin, one bass. But I have all these wonderful instruments. Um, I have a, a wonderful uh, old Martin that was given to me by the widow of the man who taught me how to play, who was the high school custodian in 1960, Bill Smith, who played on the weekends in a country band. He passed away from Parkinson's disease. I was with him the last day or two days before he died. And his wife gave me this beautiful guitar of his. And uh, that's one that's a special one. I have a mandolin Stephen Stills gave me that I do not take on the road. It's too valuable. And he gave that to me in 1972. Just a wonderful gesture. Uh, I have a Martin uh, signature Chris Hillman model that is also a great guitar that Martin made for me. They, they did one for McGuinn and David Crosby signature guitars. David Crosby model. The Roger McGuinn model, the Chris Hillman model, it's very nice. I'm very honored with that. So, uh, yeah, you know, I don't have that many. I've got, I have some friends that have 200 guitars. I have maybe 15. I don't know. Too many. I have 14 too many, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We have time for a couple more questions. So Dave Comden wants to know, what is your method of writing songs? Is it lyrics or music first? You know, it changes. Sometimes you'll come up with an idea for a, a melody or a hook or a, a line, just a, 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 some words. I used to be so involved in it that if I heard something, somebody say something, I'd write it down. It, it, uh, just a phrase. And, and it, sometimes it would turn into a pretty good song. Uh, I've been working with Steve Hill, a fellow that used to live in Ventura too. And, uh, I've been working with Steve for over 30 years and we just, hit it off. It was a real Lennon-McCartney relationship. Uh, most all of the successful Desert Rose Band hits that were on Billboard, on the radio, on Billboard charts, uh, Steve and I wrote. But then early stuff I wrote by myself, or I'd write with McGuinn or David and Roger and Stephen and I wrote, Stills and I wrote a lot of songs together. So it's, you know, I don't know. I, it's sometimes you come up with a lyric, sometimes with a melody, yeah. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. So this one's from Bob Barbieri. And he says, Manassas was the most underrated band of the 1970s. I saw a fantastic show at the Berkeley Community Theater with Roger McGuinn sitting in for a few tunes with you as well. Tell us a little about the dynamics of that great band. It was a great band. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, say that along with you. Uh, Maybe it was underrated. I don't know. I know I never looked at it like that. It seems like more people are always commenting how, how wonderful that band was. It was a great band live, as as a gentleman said when he saw us in Berkeley. Uh, fantastic band. And when I was asked to do that, I was kept on my toes. Those guys that Stephen was working with were really good, and I went okay. And I just when I went for it, but it was good. I liked the stimulation. But it was a joyful thing and it went as long as it should, two years. Uh, like I said earlier, Stephen goes back with Crosby and Nash. I go with Souther and Ure. And off we went to another adventure. So I have a question and it's for both Chris and Ivor from Marshall Terrell, who wants to know, can you guys talk a little bit about how you met, how you maintained your friendship, and uh, Chris specifically, why do you trust Ivor as much as you do? Trust him. The man owes three thousand dollars. Wait a minute. Wait, Wait on a the second, man owes Chris. three thousand oh, dollars. No, yeah. <laughs> He's. I love Ivor. Let me tell you something. Everybody out there, Ivor Davis is one of the last true journalists 
who got sent over here to go on the road with the Beatles in 1963, is it Ivor, 63, 64? Yes, you're right, yeah, uh, yeah. But, yep. and, and this man worked for newspapers. He was a journalist. It's not like the media we have now. It's not the same. Uh, he's the last of a true, true journalist. And he's a, he's a well-published author. He's got two good books out. Do I trust him? We'll talk later after the show. Yeah, oh, I love him. He's a, yeah, we, he was my neighbor too. You know, we, he was a wonderful man, wonderful man. Yeah, no, but, you know, this, is a a bit, man. this is too damned excessive. Let's let's <laughs> let's move, move on. I just want to say one thing about Chris. I mean, he has some talent, as we know. But what I love about Chris is that I see him wandering around the streets of of our community, walking the dog. And he's out with Connie. I mean, he's not, he does not play the rock star. He's he does like not that, play. Dave. No, I, I cherish my anonymity. I never wanted Tom Petty last interview Tom Petty did for the LA times. And, and he says, I don't think Chris ever liked show business. And I read that. I said, boy, he got it right. I didn't like show business. I didn't want to ride in a limousine. I was a musician. But no, I cherish my anonymity. Yeah, I know. We go where we want to go. And I know because Tom, when he Tom would go out on a tour, the last tour he did uh, that summer before he passed, he couldn't leave his hotel room. And most of those guys that are on that level, you can't even go out on, on the on uh, out of your room. And I, I remember uh, Bob Dylan. Somebody said he used to dress up as a homeless man and he'd go out in the street and hang out. Man. Probably didn't have to change his wardrobe too much, but anyway, so uh, <laughs> that's just one of those things. I didn't want that. That wasn't part of it. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a really great note to wrap up on. I think that you guys just shared your uh, really wonderful relationship, and I think it's time for us to all of these questions because we would literally be here for yeah. another hour. All of these questions I will forward to Chris and we'll do our best to get answers to them. They're all documented in our Q&A. Uh, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over at this point in time to Mr. Hillman for a few final words. Well, I want, I want uh, Denise, thank you. Denise Sindler, Elena Brokaw, Eric Knight and Jonathan McGee at the Museum of Ventura County for the good work you've done. And I, I did another thing with you folks a while back. Um, they did a wonderful exhibit on me. But and this is a wonderful thing. I wanna tell everybody out there, um, become a member of this museum. It's it, 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 the, the historical uh, part of it all. And, and they have such wonderful exhibits. If not, if you don't live here, send a donation in. We need this. We need this museum here as we have these wonderful things in Ventura. Uh, we need to support them at all times. So I also want to say uh, to my dear friend and fellow author, that's nice. I like saying that, Ivor, that I can almost say that I'm your fellow author, but you have many more things you've done than me. But uh, thank you, Ivor, for having me on your show. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Ivor. And like I say, please support the museum. I really, I can't tell you how important that is. Uh, in any town you live in, support the museums. Uh, we need them very badly. So thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Ivor. Well, thank you, Chris. And, and Jonathan was gonna play something so that I could go out singing. We could go out singing together. <laughs> I, but I haven't, when you're ready, Jonathan, because this is a, a lovely piece, but I, I just want to say everything that Chris has said, uh, he's named everybody in the museum who's really worked very hard to get this to happen, to make this happen. Please support the museum. And I want to also thank guys like Tom Spence, oh, KVTA, absolutely. who is a terrific supporter Wonderful of man. the community. He's great, has a great show. And also, I want to thank Connie Pappas Hillman, the girl that almost slipped through Chris's hands. Just almost. About, almost, yeah. Almost, but didn't thank heavens for you. Oh, I think she's up for sainthood, Ivor. Yes. Okay, but, let me know about that. We do a program. <laughs> and by the way, can I plug you? Uh, Ivor's next show, I believe, is with Malcolm McDowell. What a fascinating man he is. 
and uh, his acting and all that he has done. And I was telling Ivor earlier today, uh, one of my favorite movies that Malcolm McDowell did was Oh Lucky Man. Yes. I love that movie. So I know Ivor, you'll be talking to him about him doing that movie. Yes. Oh, I mean, uh, you're right. Malcolm is, is, is a terrific, again, again, like you, a raconteur. I should bring you two together. He oh. is a terrific storyteller, wonderful, and he does voices as well. This I can't do, I don't know if you can do voices, but, but anyway, maybe our next uh, program will do voices, but he's terrific. And then I want to add one other thing. My third program in the series is with Miriam Arachea. Now, Miriam, I don't think has is, is, is made any movies, but she is a brilliant pianist. She's a lawyer. She's a, a Renaissance woman. And you've got to tune into that one. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.